All right, after that little introduction uh, to chapter three, let's start looking at the evidence. Now, I mentioned in the introduction that we want to be looking for changes that are taking place that are more like us. How are we becoming us? Uh, how are our ancestors evolving and adapting to environmental and genetic conditions that are creating new species that are adapting to their environments and which one of those species is our relative. So you had the last common ancestor about nine million years ago uh, with uh, chimpanzees and bonobos. Chimpanzees and bonobos went off in that direction and our ancestors went off in that direction. But what's our ancestor? Because Think about this for a second. Um, you have two parents, and they have two parents, which means you've got four grandparents. Each one of your grandparents has two parents. So it starts to get exponentially larger. We're talking about a lot of different creatures that, <laughs> that have come to converge to create you and your life. Which one of these things is part of our line? How did we come through that? And not some other creature over here that is similar to us, but not us. So, they're, let's look at just chimpanzees and bonobos. They're very similar to one another, but they have uh, slightly different characteristics, different behaviors, and slightly different genetic makeup. So they're different species. <clears throat> um, so it's going to get a little confusing this in this chapter and I want to simplify it because of the reason that we're looking at this is because we want not we want to find our ancestors and we want to see <clears throat> the reasons why we came through this evolutionary process with the features that we now have so how did we lose uh, some of the features that our, ans our common answer with chimpanzees and bonobos had. Well, as it turns out, these ancestors lived in a forested area. So they had adaptations for living and uh, existing in trees, right? And we know that that's the case with chimpanzees and bonobos today. They still live there, which is why that's their natural habitat. And so they have adaptations for hanging out in trees. Now, have you ever tried to climb a tree? Probably. Um, <clears throat> if, you, if you were to hold on to a branch with your hand, how long do you think you could hold on to that branch? A little while, maybe. But eventually your grip is going to, is going to weaken and you're going to fall out. You can't hold on forever. But some types of monkeys, apes, uh, primates, actually have their default hand shape as like a hook. And so they're not going to fall out of the tree because their relaxed state is a, a hook hand. That's an adaptation for a lot of time spent in trees. Now, what, how does adaptation work? Well, if you don't have that, you might fall out of that tree. And what happens when you fall on the tree? A leopard can come in and eat you. So you don't survive and you don't pass on that flat hand to the next generation. So why did we lose that hook hand? If uh, primates that live in trees have hook hands, why did we lose it? And what was the purpose of having hands like we have today? They're very similar to Prime, other primate hands, but we have some special ca characteristics. Also, primates are pretty smart, <clears throat> but we're smarter. We are smarter. And we use a lot of resources to create a brain that is smarter. So you would think that if it costs so much energy expenditure to make this brain, why don't we just invest in fast speed so we can get away so from danger. Well, our evolutionary history shows us that we were more successful with the characteristics that we have today. 
<clears throat> so our ancestors, we want to look at those ancestors that have evidence for those features emerging. Now, one of those uh, is one of the obvious things is bipedalism. That is to say, standing on two feet habitually. Now, some other animals can stand on their two feet. A, a raccoon can stand on two feet. A squirrel can stand on two feet. Uh, a bear. Primates, other primates can stand on two feet. <clears throat> but they don't habitually, normally have posture that is upright like we do. We're one of the very rare animals that has that. And our bones fit together in a way that it would be really difficult for us to be quadrupedal or even knuckle walkers. Like a, you look at a gorilla or a chimpanzee, they walk on their knuckles. That's because their spines and their heads are connected at a particular angle. And you've got uh, what's called the, um, uh, the pharang oh, sorry, foramen magnus, the, the, uh, 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 the foramen is the uh, hole at the base of the skull that is uh, that is connects the spine to the the head, right? So right here at the base of my skull, I've got kind of a good skull to demonstrate this. Right at the uh, the base of the the skull, um, it connects to my spine at sort of a perpendicular angle. Uh, so, but at it with a a monkey, or a a um, a dog or something like that, the back of their skull, right back here, is their foramen magnum. And so their spines and their heads connect that way, which means that their normal posture is with their spine that's horizontal, right? And that's to be predicted. Can you teach a a, a dog to stand on its hind legs? Yes. But is that its normal posture? No. And you can tell that because the spine and the head connect in this way. A chimpanzee and a, or a, an, a, a gorilla, their, spot, their foramen magnum is sort of drifted a little bit down from exactly the back of their head to sort of an oblique angle. And that allows them to very comfortably knuckle walk because they can lift their heads up and down, side to side, at, in that posture. They can look up, straight up, they can look straight down, they can look, but this is their normal posture looking dead forward when their spine is situated like that. If they were to stand upright, they'd have to be looking down. Now, we have our foramen magnum at the base of our skull, which means that our normal posture is like this. If I were to try a knuckle walk, and I, I can't demonstrate it to you right now, but give it a try. Get on your knees, or get on your, sorry, your hands and, and on your knuckles and put your feet there and look forward. If you're looking forward in that posture, you're actually looking up. You're straining your neck just to look forward. And try and look up, you can't do it. Your, your neck doesn't bend that far. So if we were to try and knuckle walk like uh, a, a chimpanzee, we'd really struggle to do that. Now, that is because our ancestors adapted, for some reason, upright walking. So if you can find even a fragment of a skull that doesn't have, uh, of one of our ancestors, that doesn't have that oblique angle of the foramen magnum, but has that foramen magnum that's migrated to the very base of the skull, you can pretty reasonably assume that that creature from the past walked upright. Make sense? So you don't need a lot of evidence, although there actually are multiple places on the body, seven or eight of them, that indicate upright walking. So little fragments of bones that are found, or fossil bo fossilized bones um, that are found can actually tell us a lot of information about the evolutionary history of our ancestors. Um, another thing that's important to look for is diet. I've talked a bit about, um, about how it's all about surviving to pass on your genes to the next generation. Why don't we have fangs like chim chimpanzees and, and, uh, and gorillas? Well, those 
fangs that they use are primarily for slicing fruit. Why don't we have those? Wouldn't that be nice to have that? Uh, there's other considerations that um, gorillas and chimpanzees use their teeth to impress females and to intimidate other males that might be their sexual competitors. Um, we don't have that ability to do that. We've got to, in, I've got to impress females by other means than my, showing my teeth. Uh, so uh, the, how did we lose these and why? That's really important, why? Your mouth is where all of your nutrition comes in. So the, a creature's diet is going to be reflected in the type of adaptations you get in the teeth. So why did our adaptations for a different type of tooth start to emerge? We still have those, uh, those fangs, but they've shrunk and they don't grow throughout our lifetimes. Um, a chimpanzee or a gorilla have what's called the honing canines. They grow and they slip into uh, a diastema, a little um, sheath in their lower teeth that continually sharpens. Every time they close their mouth, they're sharpening their fangs. That allows them to have fresh, nice, pointy teeth. We don't have that diastema and our canines that still exist have reduced and they don't, uh, um, they don't grow throughout our lifetime or sharpen. Uh, so that probably indicates a different type of diet. So our ancestors started to eat different things. And what, so what were those things? And, and so chimpanzees and bonobos continued to have this honing canine. Uh, and they continued to walk uh, or... Uh, have bipedal or sorry um uh, knuckle walking locomotion or quadrupedal locomotion and our ancestors started to develop different characteristics that were going in a different direction so if you can find just a tooth that is a, uh, a non-honing or peri-honing canine then that might be an indication that this is one of our ancestors <clears throat> The other thing to keep in mind is that there were a lot of different methods of surviving. There wasn't just one size fits all that if you have this, then you survive. There's a lot of chance and uh, a, a lot of, well, generally kind of luck. You either survive or you don't. Even if you've got all the, the greatest tools, a meteor could fall on your head and, and that's it. So you've got great genes, you've got all the survival tools that you need, but something happens, right? Tough luck. That's the way nature works. Uh, so there are multiple strategies for survival that our ancestors were taking on, becoming different species. And so just because you see a creature that is bipedal, that's walking on two feet, that has that, um, that uh, um, foramen magnum that's that's situated at the bottom of the skull, that doesn't mean it's our ancestor. It means that it's on, it's closer, more closely related to us than anything else, but it's not, it may or may not be our direct ancestor. It could have been one of our ancestors' competitors, in fact, a different species existing at the same time. This was, this was a, uh, something that paleoanthropologists a long time ago uh, didn't quite have all the evidence for. And so when you would find something, you would try and put it in a chronological sequence to see that it was a, pro a progression. But now we understand that it's not all the same development, that you have different lines fanning out and that some of them are contemporary and competitors rather than ancestors of one another or descendants of one another. That's how it gets confusing. So. An easy answer to this, uh, the question of what is this fossil in our lineage, it has become more complicated. It was easier when, when you had just a, you know, a handful of fossils. You could say, okay, this is one of our human ancestors, right? But now we have hundreds of thousands of fossils that we have to sort of situate. We're filling out a more clear picture, but 
we're also complicating it because life in the past was complicated. So you're going to see different terms used for different things. And I'm going to try and simplify it for you because what I really want you to learn is are the main points for understanding our evolution. Uh, and less so about the details about every single species or variation of species or subspecies or genus or maybe rejection of genuses. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see uh, uh, some tables that uh, talk about timelines and um, you'll see overlaps, right? So you see uh, on table 3 one it says Australopithecus four to 2.5 million years ago. Uh, and then you see Kenyanthropus, which is 3.5 million years ago, and Paranthropus, which is 2.5 to 1.4 million years ago. But then you also have Homo habilis, 2.5 to 1.6 million years ago, and Homo erectus, 1.9 to 45 uh, million to 45-ish thousand years ago. So these are overlapping, and they've got different names. I'm gonna simplify for this for you as much as I possibly can. I've got a, a, a map uh, as well on the slideshow that shows where the known locations are in Africa for human ancestors dating back to the earliest ones uh, that go back to about seven million years ago. So not quite to that common ancestor with chimpanzees and bonobos, but getting there pretty close. Um, and a lot of them are of, on this map are situated in what I described as the, the East Rift Valley, uh, especially a cluster in um, Olduvai Gorge. So this is where it's easy to access fossils. We know that they exist there, so there's been a lot of work done there. Um, but South Africa is now emerging as an uh, interesting place to study, and we have a lot of evidence, but it doesn't seem to fit uh, very well into what we understand from the East Rift Valley. So you have different names for species down there because it looks like they were doing something different. It's unlikely that those South African uh, species are our direct ancestors because they have some problematic clues there. Uh, and the ones that are in the East Rift Valley make a little bit more sense. But you also have some off-the-wall places like uh, um, Sahelanthropus chadensis uh, in the country of Chad, uh, Toros Manala um, is the site there, where um, that uh, was a real surprise to people because that's the earliest um, probable um, hominin remains that have ever been found, dating to about seven million years ago. So I have, I included, this isn't in your book, but I included it in the slideshow because it's, uh, there's a timeline for the things we're going to talk about here. And it simplifies things in a way that I want to focus on. We have three genuses and species um, that are the earliest. <clears throat> and we're not sure if the first couple of them are really related to us or if they were early um, uh, species that died out and aren't our ancestors, but may have been our ancestors' competitors. The earliest of those is Sahelanthropus jodensis, um, which date to about 7 million years ago. Um, and they, this was probably an upright, small, chimp-like creature, but was walking bipedally. They also had what's probably considered a peri-honing canine uh, or a non-honing canine. So they were starting to lose their teeth through a different form of diet. But it comes from a forested environment, so they must have spent a bit of life in trees. So this was kind of like an upright walking, uh, maybe not even uh, um, totally upright walking. We don't have full evidence, or it's a little bit controversial. Um, uh, forest-dwelling, chimp-like creature. Um, <clears throat> the next one is Auroran to Genesis, uh, which uh, dates to about six million years ago. And we have evidence from its legs that show that they had adaptations that are indicative of bipedal walking as well. And then you have a couple of species, um, Artipithecus cadaba and Artipithecus rambidus, um, which date to about um, 
4.5 or 5 million years ago. And these are almost certainly on our lineage, especially Ramidus. Ar Ardipithecus Ramidus is a pre-Australopithecine, an early ancestor that almost certainly gave rise to the next group uh, cluster of creatures called the Australopithecines, um, means southern ape, uh, Australopithecus means southern ape. Um, so Ardipithecus is uh, a um, a dates to uh, comes from Ethiopia or Aramidus at least does and it was we have most of a skeleton it's sort of uh, called Ardi in fact this is it's been given the name Ardi so Ardi has been found and it has really interesting features that it looks like an upright walking ape. It's pretty clear that it would have been habitually standing, but it also has long and curved fingers. And also its feet are not adapted to upright walking. It's still got grasping long toes. So it almost certainly spent some of its time in trees still. So it had not lost all of the adaptations for living in trees, but its posture was that of standing upright. Whenever it was on the ground, it was standing like we do. Um, and uh, but it, but it probably got food in the trees. It probably slept in the trees to keep away from predators. Um, and it didn't have a particularly large brain either. So it was uh, sort of chimpanzee-like in many ways, including its intelligence, which chimpanzees aren't stupid, but we're smarter. So after uh, about... 4 million years ago, actually after about 4.5 million years ago, you start to see a new genus. And that's a, a so uh, in that taxonomic classification scheme, um, it's a, that's a, a larger um, grouping than species, which means specific creature. We are sapiens, means thinkers. Um, but we are also in the genus Homo. So we are Homo sapiens. And so Australopithecus is a genus, but there are multiple species of Australopithecus or Australopithecines. And here's how I want to simplify this. Your book talks about um, uh, several different um, genuses, but this is sort of controversial. Not everybody agrees that there are were competitors to Australopithecines. A lot of uh, paleoanthropologists just say, Look, these are all variations of um, Australopithecines. And so you're going to see things like uh, um, Kenyanthropus, and you're going to see things like... Um